the temporary regulations strictly apply just to a jurisdiction that only decides to go forward with hand counting and not the use of machines. Because as you said and then highlighted, right, like the human error piece is something that we, we have to acknowledge. Um, you know, historically, it, it, it's hard to, to, to stare at these little bubbles and be accurate. You know, when you look at what a machine can do, you know, there's a, a tiny little dot on the ballot. It, it will detect that in a way that, that simply, you know, people can't, uh, especially, you know, five, six, seven hours into to a hand count tabulation or, you know, the, the seventh hour of their 10th day of doing so. Well, and there was an aspect of the original plan that had a maximum of 20 ballots per batch to be counted. You increased that to 50. Why did you think that was appropriate? It, and it may help, and if it's okay, I could describe the kind of the process as it as a you know from a big picture. Yes, please. Um, the, the way we've heard in the best practice that we we adopted based on the Nevada Revised Statutes um, was was ultimately to have four individuals involved in the process. Uh, you have a, a reading clerk who has the ballot in front of them. You have a verification clerk, an individual who's standing watching the individual read over it to make sure that they're being accurate. And then you have two tally clerks sitting at the table. The, the regulations say at least these four. So that if there was a, a third tally clerk, for example, that would be acceptable too. The idea is that as an individual, the reading clerk goes down the entire length of that ballot um, through as many as you know, 15, 20, 25 different races, uh, as they're calling out you know, the, the first race, candidate Smith, uh, the two tally clerks are marking on their tally sheets uh, the, the appropriate um, uh, ballot cast, and, and then they just essentially go down the list. After uh, the idea is that after five uh, votes are cast for an individual, so let's say um, race number one, candidate A, uh, as soon as they say, okay, candidate A, the idea is that the tally clerk would go, oh, that's the fifth one, simply so that the two tally clerks could quickly communicate to each other to make sure they're still on the same page and staying accurate as they go through. If there's a discrepancy, by only limiting it to 20 at a batch, you would just go back through, start over again with those 20, and then be able to, again, find that discrepancy before continuing on. Uh, we had heard, uh, again, through our discussions with other jurisdictions, that 20 was about the sweet spot. There are some that use more, there's some that use less. Um, part of the reason we shifted to a uh, uh, to 50 per batch was simply so that it lined up with the amount of ballots that are typically put into a tally machine. The idea being that tally machines can provide a report based on a batch. If a batch is 50, because it makes sense to uh, have the, the maximum used in a, in a batch at one time. Um, if you have then 50 uh, up to 50, uh, that is also acceptable so that you could conceivably, uh, from an audit standpoint, have 50 run through the machine, and then have individuals tally 50. And that way, again, it's two batches. You can see what was the, see the results from the, the individuals and compare them directly to the machines without having to do any conversion type issues uh, or potentially slow the process. But again, we did say up to, so that if uh, an election official chooses to, to stick to 20, that that's acceptable as well. And there will be counties who are doing that simultaneous process of tabulating via machine and then hand counting. But as you made that distinction, which is important, if it is not their primary method, hand counting, if that is not the primary method, they are not subjected to the regulations that the state handed down. Why did you choose to not impose your regulations on those counties as well? Yes, ma'am. In, in part because there was no legal authority to do so. Um, in part because the, the use of those machines, if a county is going to use the machines as the primary method for tabulation, um, then like from a, a state point of view, from the concerns that were raised about uh, timeliness, uh, compliance with the statutory deadlines, um, all of those go away as long as there's a machine that we know that uh, again, we'll provide that accurate result up front. But again, right, there's there's a number of, of voters across the state who have concerns about the machines, and this essentially enables the clerks to have a, a process or procedure, even in that sort of dual machine plus human uh, counting process, where now voters in the counties can come in and essentially audit the machines and yeah, see that the machines are accurate. Uh, and, and again, hopefully regain confidence in the process and procedures and uh, the equipment used to, to uh, you know, uh, administer our elections. 
You brought up two points, uh, the delays that may come along with hand counting all of the votes. What happens if a county is not able to meet the deadline of when it is supposed to have all those votes hand counted? As long as they're using a machine first, uh, again, the, the timelines will be met without any issue. If, um, not, if they though, don't use a machine, uh, yes, ma'am. And that's that's part of you. you I'm sure noticed in the, the um, regulations that were adopted. Uh, there, there's a number of required reports um, and documents that, that we've asked for. Um, specifically, one of them is to address the contingencies uh, where if, uh, you know, for example, we have a statute that says the Board of County Commissioners or Board of Supervisors must canvass the vote no later than the 10th day after the election. Using this coming general election, for example, if there was a county that said we're not using machines, we just wish to conduct a hand count tabulation. Um, uh, there's a requirement for this contingency plan because I don't want them to get to the night of the 17th to then wonder what happens if we're not going to make the deadline? What happens if we can't? Uh, you know, we're, we're encouraging them and requiring this, the development of this plan to, uh, to encourage that conversation with the district attorney in advance and the commissioners to understand the, the full scope of, uh, of, of possibilities that could emerge uh, from missing those timelines. Because you're right, this is, uh, it's, it's something kind of unique, uh, kind of crossing the Rubicon, so to speak, uh, in, in a way that hasn't happened here in the state before. Um, and I will tell you, not one of our county election officials uh, is interested in, in getting to that point. So that, that is part of the concern. Uh, but certainly when we provided these regulations, it, it provides a template. Uh, it's scalable. Uh, we talked about a team of four, but there I anticipate would be numerous teams of four to meet the required timelines. Um, but yes, that, that is certainly a concern. Who are these people, this team of four? They're, they're voters in the, uh, uh, in the individual counties. Uh, again, we, we encourage and uh, require as practical, practicable uh, bipartisan or multipartisan teams, uh, but they would be individuals from within the counties that conduct the, the hand counts. And that is important because I think there are concerns about subversion attempts by people who are hand counting these votes or even the people who are overseeing some of the elections. Your thoughts on having a person oversee an election who does not believe that the 2020 results were true? Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you that uh, my experience with our, our 17 uh, elected and uh, appointed election officials at the county level, the, the clerks and registrars, um, has truly been inspiring over the last two years. Uh, I was appointed as the deputy for elections in October of 20. Uh, and since then, even with the, there's been some turnover, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, at the county levels and here at the state, and, and not even with the clerks and registrars, but with, with also with their staff members uh, across the board. Everyone is committed to and determined to provide Nevadans uh, with their abilities to vote in free and fair elections, period. Um, are, are there individuals who maybe have questions about the 2020 election process? Perhaps. Um, I, I will tell you the election officials who were here during 2020 uh, and, and who administered that election, again, are, are confident in the processes and procedures. Um, so really, I, I don't spend as much time looking backwards now at this point uh, as we do is on focusing going forward. Uh, for any election official, again, and that's this is the easiest question, the best softball you could ask them. Uh, is it a complex process? Absolutely. Uh, Title 24, as we refer to uh, the, the nine chapters of statutes, plus nine chapters of regulation, plus numerous federal laws, all of these have to be um, applied and uh, you know, executed and enforced to make an election happen. Um, that, that's no small feat. It, it truly is a team sport to review, to remind each other, to help out, uh, to make sure that all of the required pre-election audits, the timelines to order ballots, to get machines set up, to uh, arrange for and hire appropriate numbers of poll workers, to train the poll workers, to make sure that they're trained and equipped to do their jobs. This is a, a very complex process. Um, and, and so when someone asks questions about you know, previous election cycles, um, I, I find that the, the most questions that you get are typically from individuals who aren't directly involved in the process. Um, but so, again, for someone to, to administer or even, uh, you know, uh, volunteer at a polling location who had questions or concerns about previous election cycles, any previous election cycle, uh, frankly, I welcome it. Because when you see and you're in the mix and you see the statutes that we have to follow, right? We don't pick and choose the laws we follow. We don't pick and choose the regulations we obey and enforce and, and apply. 
uh, then you realize how much security, how much redundancy there is to make sure the process is, is free and fair and that every single legal vote cast is, is counted appropriately. How many counties are you aware of right now that intend to do only hand counting? Only hand counting? Uh, so far, none. Um, there's There's been some discussion about possibly uh, machine uh, as primary and then hand count audits. Um, but but as, it, as we currently stand, uh, to the best of my understanding, uh, no counties in Nevada are going to rely purely on hand count tabulations during the 2022 election cycle. All right. So then if we add that using hand counting as a secondary method or a parallel method, what happens if the hand counting result shows a different outcome of a contest than the tabulation or the machine uh, method? It's an excellent question as well. And as it currently stands also, again, the, the machine count will be the one that's that's used uh, for the certification process. Um, but again, I, I would anticipate uh, if a machine has one um, result and the human hand count has another, the intent by keeping those batches to 50 or less is specifically so that they can address those discrepancies and, and identify where the, the concerns are. Um, and I suspect when that happens, and, and I anticipate it will, uh, it will go back to a, uh, you know, a bit, bit of a human error. Again, they're, they're well-intentioned individuals, but um, if you haven't stared at little circles uh, or done anything like that for eight hours continuously, um, it, it can be a bit much, and, and human error does happen, uh, which is why, again, as long as we have a mechanical device as a backup uh, and really as primary, um, I, I don't think there will be any issues. And, and truly, right, even if the hand count takes months to, to go through, um, at, at some point, or uh, months is probably a bit extreme, but uh, more than a couple of days. Uh, again, I, I don't think voters have to con be worried or concerned about those sorts of issues. All right. Uh, last question. If I understand correctly, these are regulations for this election only. They're temporary. Are there plans to make them permanent? Yes. Absolutely. These, these are temporary regulations and they're good through uh, November 1st of 2023, um, unless we put them through the permanent regulatory process, uh, which is something I, I anticipate the Office of the Secretary of State doing. Um, e even if there's no future discussion, even if there's no intent to, to have a hand count pure tabulations during the 2023 uh, cycle, which by the way, again, there's there's no scheduled elections, but there may be a recall election, maybe a special election. There's always there's reasons for that uh, in the interim years. Um, uh, the, the intent is to put these through the permanent regulatory process. As we continue to learn from uh, those individuals that do hand count audits uh, during this cycle um, and continue to ask uh, my, my counterparts across the country for, for continued improvement. Mark Veloshin, thank you for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on.